Um, so good afternoon, everybody. It's, this is Keith Watkins with the Arizona Commerce Authority. Um, this is the third in our Empowering Rural Arizona webinar series. Uh, today we have Mary Daron. Is that how I, it's pronounced, Daron? Yes, uh-huh, Daron. Um, and Mary is, uh, joins us today from the FDIC. She's a Senior Community Affairs Specialist. Uh, in her duties, she fosters collaborative efforts focused on economic inclusion, community development, and small business financial education, all the while managing the FDIC Los Angeles Alliance for Economic Inclusion. Uh, Mary, thanks for joining us today. Uh, Mary's uh, uh, really uh, gone to great efforts to be with us today. She's on vacation, so she's far <laughs> from her vacation to to join us. So um, uh, we're uh, we're pleased uh, that you're here with us today. Um, you've you've got um, folks from the rural economic development uh, community here in Arizona on the line. And uh, we'd love to learn more about the Community Reinvestment Act. Sounds terrific. So uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you. Uh, next slide. Um, just to let you know, um, the purpose today is to provide you with general information regarding the Community Reinvestment Act. Um, and you can use the chat function if you like to let me know what you plan to uh, present. So what we're going to go over today is I'll give you a very brief overview of the FDIC, about our community affairs program, economic inclusion initiatives, and then obviously focus on what you're here to learn about is Community Reinvestment Act and the development of bank partnerships, uh, which can help you strengthen it. So the FDIC was founded in 1933, and it was in direct response to the uh, Great Depression. And um, many of us would probably not have known what that really meant, other than watching it on movies, if we ourselves hadn't gone through the Great Recession. And as a result of the Great Recession, um, the insured amount was increased to $250,000, uh, per account uh, per bank. And there are various ways of which you can maintain accounts so that you actually could have more than 250,000 insurance. Um, and all that kind of information is on our website. We are an independent agency of the federal government. And um, since we were launched on January 1st of 1934, no depositor has lost a single cent from an FDIC insured account as a result of the failure. And so the other function that we also supervise banks and we're responsible for consumer protection. And that includes if a bank has failed, we take over the institution. And usually the way we resolve it is by selling um, it to another uh, financial institution so that you um, maintain your account. So the Community Affairs Program is part of the FDIC's Division of Depositor and Consumer Protection. I'm part of the San Francisco region, which covers the 11 Western states, including Alaska and Hawaii and the territory of Guam. Next. I wanted to share with you one of the core functions, well, one of the core functions of Community Affairs is to conduct events such as today, uh, participate and share information on CRA, provide technical assistance, and then pursue what we call initiatives to promote economic inclusion. And we have a little ladder. So we start off with the basics of financial education, uh, promoting insured banking deposits, consumer credit is a, cre uh, is a key asset um, because it can determine at what cost you can borrow money um, or whether you can get a loan, mortgage credit, and ultimately small business. Community Reinvestment Act is what we're here to talk about today. Next. Um, so the Community Reinvestment Act was enacted in 1977 to encourage regulated financial institutions to help meet the credit needs of the communities they serve including low and moderate income neighborhoods 
consistent with safe and sound banking operations. Next. So bank examiners conduct two exams. One is a risk uh, management exam, which looks at the financial conditions of each institution. In addition to that, they uh, also have a compliance examination that looks at how banks comply with all the consumer protection laws, including the Community Reinvestment Act. Next. So there are three basic regulators that oversee the financial institutions and are responsible for regulating the Community Reinvestment Act. So the FDIC regulates all the non-Federal Reserve member state chartered banks. The Federal Reserve Bank uh, regulates all the state chartered banks and holding companies. And then the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency regulates all the national chartered banks. So the national chartered banks are the ones that will always have NA at the end of their name. And so those are the big banks that you're all probably familiar with. But to find out who a regulator is, the FDIC has a terrific link on their website, fdic.gov backslash bank find. And you can enter a bank's name and it will tell you who the regulator is. You can see where their branches are. You can access financial information. It's a great tool and we'll be talking a little bit more about it as we proceed. So the supervisory agencies in, uh, under the Community Reinvestment Act are responsible to review and ensure that uh, banks are meeting the credit needs of the local communities in which they operate and also obviously to encourage them to do more. And we take into account the CRA record so that it needs to be satisfactory or higher, and we'll get to that in a couple of slides, because it's a key element when a bank wants to open branches, uh, conduct a merger, acquire another bank, or even to consolidate. So having a satisfactory CRA rating is a key element for any of those transactions. So what's the role of financial institution? Well, they have to demonstrate that they serve the convenience and needs of the communities in which they operate, and they have to operate within the boundaries of safety and soundness. So there are four key elements, and we're gonna drive into each one of them. So there's the assessment area, community development, activities and whether they're responsive to the credit needs and we'll go into what defines community development. Low and moderate income persons or geography. So CRA is only about income, whether your low and moderate income is where the assessment goes and compares it to middle and upper income. And then there's performance context. And within performance context, which we'll discuss a little further, is what we call community contacts. And this is where all of you representing uh, community-based organizations can play a significant role in the examination process when you are a community contact. Next. So assessment areas. This is really a key element to understand CRA. And, um, you know, it's often referred to as geographies, which just means census tracts. So all of CRA is divided by census tracts. And an assessment area has to include the bank's main office, its branches, and deposit taking ATMs. And the bank has the ability to determine how they're gonna designate their assessment areas, but there are parameters around it including that they can't set them up to discriminate certain neighborhoods. So most banks will include an entire county. But if there's a branch in an area, that branch has to have an assessment area, whether it's the municipality or the county. Um, and it has to be a whole geography, so it means it has to be the whole census tract. Keith, were you going to ask a question? Or? No, no, that's quite interesting. I didn't know uh, about the assessment areas. Yes, yeah, so when you're looking for a bank um, to do something in your neighborhood, if your neighborhood isn't in their assessment area or what can be now called the broader assessment area, um, they may not 
desire to do it because it's not part of what they will be evaluated in. I see. Um, next. So what do we be, mean by low and moderate income? So it's low income as an individual income or track income that is less than 50% of the median family income. And moderate is between 50 and 80% of the area medium income. And that's primarily the focus of CRA, the activities that are low and moderate income. But since I'm speaking to you, all who um, may be in rural areas, there is an exception to this. So if the community development activity is to revitalize or stabilize activities in distressed or underserved non-metropolitan middle income areas. So it can go up to 120% of area medium income if your geography, if the census track, is considered to be one that is distressed or underserved. And there's a website to get this information to determine whether your census tract fits that area. So this is one exclusion that is beneficial for rural areas. So if a community wanted to find out where they, where they rank here, they would go to that website? Yes, and, and um, I'll have a link later on and okay. you, it's pretty cool. You can put your address in and find out all kinds of information about your neighborhood wow. um, and what Me. income level and demographics it is. Okay. Next slide. So community development. So this is a key element in, and you'll hear this term a lot. And this is a term that you should become familiar with so that as you're developing relationships with banks, that you're talking the same language. So it has to meet the primary purpose of an activity has to be community development to receive CRA credit. So this means that the majority of the activity or the majority of the beneficiaries of the activity are related to a community development purpose. And so what's majority? It could be something as, you know, 51% or, or at least 51% of the activity, its primary purpose is to help low mod income, then that could count. Next, so what is a community development? So it has to have a primary purpose that is designated for the express purpose of affordable housing for low mod. So remember LMI, the limit is 80% or less than area median income. And this is still true for rural areas. That's not where the exemption is. Community services targeted to low mod income individuals. So what's a community service you might ask? Well, community service could be childcare, could be educational, could be clinics, could be some social service programs. So a community service that helps, a market in a low mod income community, financing it, particularly if it's, you know, what's called a food desert, which means there's no markets in those lower income communities. The bank finance is one of those. It, it meets the definition of community development because the population that's gonna access the market is low mod income. Economic development for small business. So um, economic activities have to meet a size test and um, promote CRA economic development via their purpose. So the size test is that it could be an SBA development company or small business community program, SBIC, or have gross annual inc revenues of less than a million dollars. And it has to create permanent jobs or retain jobs and or is improving for low mod income individuals uh, or geographies. Or it could be a targeted, um, which also goes into the revitalization and stabilization, is it could be part of a targeted revitalization stabilization program. So for example, if the municipality decides that a certain area like the downtown of the community needs to be revitalized and it sets this up within a plan 
then that's your documentation that this has been determined to be that. And, you know, it has to also retain or create jobs. So that all is part of what the bank has to document to prove mm -hmm. that the loan meets the requirements. So this is under the, the guise of um, approving a loan for community development purposes. Is that right? Yes, it could also be an investment. So for example, um, maybe um, nonprofit is developing a building that it's going to be utilizing uh, for services that it provides. Um, it's got some financing, but it still has a gap and maybe a bank provides it a grant. It could meet that definition, you know, okay. so it doesn't always have to be just a loan, but more than likely these are loans. Uh, but banks have done grants uh, or can do grants, I suppose. Yes. Provided they can. meet meet this criteria. Correct. Okay. Um, so what's the kind of, this kind of takes us, Keith, right into the next slide. So what's, there's tr three types of community development activities. The loans that we were just talking about, investments, uh, also known as qualified investments, are an investment, a deposit, a membership share, or a grant that includes monetary or in-kind donations. So um, back when, and it's probably true now, but you know, probably during the 90s, there were ma more bank consolidation. So sometimes the banks were left with branches. So some of them would donate at these branches to a nonprofit. So it was so in-kind donation. Mm. Um, they um, can also do, a bank can do an EQ2 investment. So it could invest into a nonprofit, say half a million dollars. It's looking for a return somewhere, probably between zero and 4% of a return. Each bank sets their own guidance of what they're looking for usually somewhere between five and seven years. Uh, some could be as low as they're willing to put the money out there for three years. Um, and then they expect it back. Um, and so that would still be a, a qualified investment. Uh, a deposit, so for example, if there's a minority depository institution, a bank could put a deposit in that and receive CRA credit because it's helping that minority depository institution. There are none in Arizona though. Mm. Um, and then community development service um, has to be, this is where the bank staff are providing a service and they get credit for this and they count up the hours and they have to document what the service is. And so it has to be, um, for the provision of financial services. And it got expanded um, a couple years back to include whatever the banker's expertise was. So for example, if a nonprofit needed assistance with IT services and the bank utilized staff who had that IT experience, they could get community development service for that. The widely used one is banks doing financial education workshops. Those mm -hmm. always count, whether for consumer or small business. Um, serving on boards of nonprofits that are community development nonprofits that receives service hours. Having, um, um, serving on a loan committee that provide of a community development focused uh, nonprofit that can receive um, CRA service. And you'll see why these three elements in a couple of slides are so important, but that's what the types of activities. And so this community development activity though must benefits the bank's assessment area or a broader statewide or regional area that includes the bank's assessment area. So for example, if a nonprofit is really a statewide nonprofit and it includes Maricopa County, and um, it does, you know, through its track record, it, it does do um, activities in Maricopa County, the bank could decide to do an investment or to do a loan to it and receive CRA credit because it's that broader regional area. 
and it or broader statewide area and their assessment areas in it. Next slide. Ah, so let me stop here and see if there's any uh, questions. I don't see anything in the chat room. All right, we're doing okay on time. All right, no questions. It's clear as mud, is it? Okay. <laughs> so, um, so here's an important element to understand is that there's really different levels of bank uh, size, which also means that they get evaluated based on their size. So there's a small bank, an intermediate small bank, or it's known as an ISB, a large bank, and then there's wholesale or limited purpose banks. Oftentimes a bank that only offers credit cards is, it could be a limited purpose um, bank. In the state of Utah, there's a lot of limited purpose banks and there's industrial loan banks. And so that state allowed their charter. So you'll find a concentration of them in, in the state of Utah. Then aside from what you'll learn about CRA, there is an option for the bank to develop its own CRA strategic plan. So they write it up and say, this is what we're gonna do. It has to be reviewed and approved by their specific regulator, but it also has to be put out to comment for community organizations to, to have an opportunity to say, yes, this makes sense, or no, they're, they're not covering this, or they should be doing more of X or more of Y. So um, depending on the state, some states have very active community groups, such as California, you won't find very much many strategic plans because they don't want to go through the public review of them. Other banks, other states will have more strategic plan, uh, plans. Each year, at the beginning of each year, the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve announces what the threshold is for small, intermediate, or large bank. Um, and you can also find them on the ffiec.gov website. Next. So there's four CRA ratings, outstanding and satisfactory. You want to be at least satisfactory. Needs to improve and substantial noncompliance. So a needs to improve or substantial noncompliance will limit your ability to open a new branch, to install a new ATM, to get acquired or to merge. So that's why the CRA rating does have um, some teeth to it and that banks comply with it. So in addition to that, um, CRA performance can be adversely affected by evidence of discrimination or illegal lending. And um, you'll learn about the, all of this is reported out in a performance evaluation. And there will only be a sentence or two if a bank in fact has been found to uh, discriminate or have illegal lending practices. And in those cases, and I've seen them in the past, they, um, if they had a satisfactory, it could get them to a needs to improve. Um, so discrimination, uh, acts of discrimination, and listed through all these regulations could affect a bank's CRA rating. Next. So performance context. So the CRA regulation recognizes that all banks are not alike and they don't operate in similar market areas either. So the regulators take into account a bank's performance while considering the institution, its community, it operates in, its competitors and its peers. So this is um, a story that the bank can share with the regulators so regulators better understand what you know what the bank's business plan is what's the community you know uh, has it been impacted in any way for example years back when a military base was shut down that could severely impact a community because now it was just a vacant land and all the transactions that occurred there and the businesses that supported the military base have been severely impacted um, 
the interestingly enough, the banks do not have to write a performance context. Um, the examination staff does, and you will find a performance context component in each um, CRA performance evaluation. Next. So I mentioned community contacts. So to gather information that could assist us, the regulators, in developing a community profile, they'll reach out to um, community-based organizations to determine what is the credit needs of the community. To there's questions related to um, what banks, you know, are are serving your community. Um, and you may get a call and you know it's very interesting um, how often community organizations do not return the call because they're going like why why is an examiner calling me and it could be an examiner from the fdic or the lcc or federal reserve bank what did i do but return the call is just an informational call and they whatever you share is confidential and they're just trying to get a better handle of the community. And they generally try mm -hmm. to reach out to organizations that serve small business, affordable housing, other types of services. Mm -hmm. I've gotten some of those calls in the past. Oh, good, and you returned the call, no doubt. I did, I did, yes, I did. <laughs> yes. Um, next. Um, so, there's a CRA exam schedule and it's published by each agency. So we let you know a quarter ahead of time which banks we will be evaluating because it's an opportunity for you to send the agency a comment about that bank on your own. You don't have to wait for us to call you. You can send it, you can ask the, and I'll talk about this in a, a minute here. Um, but the exam schedule is available the CRA performance evaluations known as PEs, this is what the examination produces at the end of the process as a performance evaluation. And you can read all about how and what they considered in the bank. You could learn from it what kinds of lending and investment they did, what they were counting for service, how many service hours. It'll tell you what their assessment areas are as well. In each Bank uh, public library, library, public lobby, um, there has to be a CRA public notice. And so you can go into any bank and ask for their CRA public file. Now in the past, they actually retained it in every single branch, but now with everything being uh, centralized and on the web, you can request it and you'll get it. And you can pick it up at the branch or they can email it to you. One, let's go back a second. So one of um, the critical elements is also a public file. And so it has to be available at the main office, but this is another thing that you can request, and this is available for you to review it. So each public file is gonna have their recent CRA performance evaluation. It's gonna have a list of the map and the branches that are part of their assessment areas. It include information about the loans and products that uh, the products and services that they offer. And in addition to that, any public comments that are submitted have to be retained in the public file along with the bank's response. And so, for example, if you write a letter to Dear Bank ABC, Dear Mr. President, I've had this issue or I think you, the bank's not doing X, Y, Z as it relates to CRA and, and these are our concerns and this is what we think you know, the, are the needs in our community. I'd like a response and please put this in your CRA public file. Even if you don't tell them, if it's a letter related to CRA, they are required to put it in their CRA public file. Mm. Um, next. So there's the, the Federal Financial Institutions Examination Council, known as the FFIEC, has its own website, and it's a centralized website. So you can review the upcoming CRA exam schedules. You can go there to get the CRA ratings. You can also download 
the CRA performance evaluations. Um, you can review what the median family income data is there per MSA. And it, it also links you to the primary regulator's website if you wanna go further. And so and this so is that, that website you referenced in the beginning about yes. how, to, how to find out if your area qualifies for a distressed or underserved or low to moderate income area. Correct. Um, yes, gotcha. next slide. You'll see it here. So this is what it looks like. And you can see that it has all kinds of information on CRA. It has the public data where you can get the ratings and the examinations. The census and demographic data is just to the right of that red arrow. And um, this is a great site uh, to get all kinds of information. And you can see up on the left hand side where it says geocoding system. So you can geocode, you can go in there, put an address and it'll tell you all about whether it's a low, middle, moderate or high income geography. There's also another page you can wet, uh, link to um, that's part of this data that tells you what the uh, composition by race of that area is. Um, but CRA, as I mentioned, is all about income. Next slide. So um, let me stop before I go to this topic. Does anyone have any questions uh, related to what I just talked about? I think. Paul has some questions down here in the chat. Um, what type of community reinvestments do these banks normally like to see? Uh, that's the first part. And then the second part is where do we find a list of banks that still need to meet their CRA requirement? <laughs> well, there's no list of, I can start with the easy one. There is no list of banks that still need to meet their CRA requirements, but um, it's really, th that kind of leads me into this next topic of developing effective relationships with um, um, nonprofits. So for whatever reason, I'm not getting in the chat room any questions, but, oh. uh, so I'm not seeing them, but. Um, uh, hmm. yeah. yeah, usually everybody sees what's in the chat room, but I'm not. Yeah. Um, so a, a couple of questions I have, Mary. So uh, does each bank branch have a CRA performance requirement? No, not necessarily, because it's a bank in its entirety. That the bank develops. in its entirety. So if, um, one of, if an economic development person for a community wanted to explore Community Reinvestment Act and partnering with the bank, which, which branch or location should they go to and who do they ask for? What kind of officer do they ask for at the bank? Great question. Now, now I see the chat question came in. Um, the, uh, they ask for the Community Reinvestment Act officer. Sometimes they're community development officers. Um, I will say that um, sometimes, depending, you know, it's not every bank, but I have seen some banks and I've worked at one that would actually push down to each region how many service hours, for example, the bank had to do so that their manager was responsible. You know, if they wanted 200, 400 hours of service locally, they were required to make sure their branch staff was handling it. Um, so each bank has put in sort of requirements, depending on how big it is to track all that. Some of them have whole, whole staffs that are looking and tracking and monitoring to make sure they're picking up um, lending service um, and investments across all of their geographies, all their census tracts, all their assessment mm -hmm. areas. Um, so do banks have different preferences, a type of CRA they would, they like to acquire? So. It depends on their expertise. So some of the major banks have established community development departments that that's all they focus on. And they're used, usually, usually doing low income housing tax credits or new markets tax credits, which are investments that are, are sold and facilitate the, the building 
of affordable housing or all kinds of uh, industrial commercial um, entities in low mod income areas. Um, some banks, you know, so the best way is that some of the banks actually have put all this on their websites and some of them now require you to request for a grant online and they'll tell you what they're looking for. So some of them like it to be in housing or if you're going to do small business education or financial or consumer financial education. Um, they have tranches that they're looking to establish based on what they've determined are the particular needs in that community. Um, so type of community reinvestments do these banks normally like to see? So it really depends on what their appetite is and what they're looking for. Uh, large banks get extra credit for um, innovation and um, taking a leadership and flexible. So they might be looking for a new fund that they could become involved in or serve as a leader to generate it. Um, some banks are looking at uh, investments into community development financial institutions to support small business or consumer lending that those entities are doing because they recognize that maybe they're not doing the small dollar loans but they, by investing into one of these entities, they are meeting that particular need of the low income community. Um, uh, yeah, Tim from Page has a question. Um, it, he says that they are not currently a CRA community by definition of AMI. AMI is currently in the process of changing with, with an undetermined time due to the loss of a major employer. Anticipating this major income shift, can we entertain a conversation of becoming a CRA? Well, there's so the Community Reinvestment Act is the, the act in itself. Whether you're low or moderate income or small business, remember it's a right. gross annual revenues of a million dollars, or it can be larger than if the community development loan is to a manufacturing company that is retaining jobs. Um, or creating new jobs in which they're going to employ low and moderate income individuals. So um, it all goes by what your geography is today in terms of whether it counts or doesn't count. So it's the census tracts. So geocode your census tracts and determine what areas are low and moderate income. And then it, depending on what kind of a loan that they're looking for, um, there's other parameters for that as well. Is it, is it revitalizing? Okay. All right. Uh, keep going. Okay. So one of the key elements that I wanted to spend some time with all of you on the call is about developing effective partnerships. So how do you do this? Well, it's really to understand the banks in your area. Do your research obtain their CRA performance evaluation. You know, um, look at the geographies that you're representing. You know, what is it, certain counties that you're, you know, your county, what banks are in your county, look them up, look at what size they are, and then um, identify or call the appropriate bank officer. So you're looking for the community development officer or the community reinvestment act officer. And that's who you wanna to begin to develop the relationship. And, and Mary, just a point of clarification, does the community reinvestment act only apply to FDIC institutions or does it apply to, to all, all three types of institutions? It applies to all Banks. All banks. Okay. Regardless. It does of not apply or... to. Okay. It does not apply to credit unions. Okay. Very good. But all all banks who enjoy FDIC insurance, which is mm -hmm. all the banks regulated by the three agencies, um, have to conform to the Community Reinvestment Act. Um, then understand the bank's differing capacities and strategies. So for example, if a bank's business strategy is that they're really just a small business lender, a commercial lender, they're not really doing mortgage lending, they're not doing you know, multifamily apartment building lending, don't go to them and ask them for a loan um, 
you know, for mortgage product, because that's not what they're doing. On the other hand, they might be interested in investing in housing related uh, opportunities to balance out the needs. Since they're not doing it directly, they could do it through investments. Um, and then really pinpoint the community development needs. You know, when you're going to talk to the banker, you want to be able to communicate with them what are the needs of the community. Or if you're part of an organization that is focused on small business or focused on housing or focused on um, providing financial education or coaching, then that might be your area of focus. So you wanna be able to talk about what those needs are. And then in developing a relationship, you know, it's about maintaining a consistent dialogue with, with the banker and getting them to understand also what your needs and capacity are. If you're doing a, a grant request or a loan request, be precise on your, on your request, not well, here's 10 things that you can choose from to fund, you know, really be precise on what, what you're looking for. And also, depending on the size of the bank, for example, uh, maybe you, in reviewing their P, performance evaluation, you note know, that they really don't, aren't huge, big grantors. So they're not gonna do the $50,000 grant. So if you go and ask for $50,000, and that's way beyond, you know, they're more in the 10 to 20,000, 5,000 uh, grant giver. They're just gonna dismiss your grant because it's beyond them even contemplating it. It's also important to provide full disclosure of your financials, your personal, your systems, your board, Depend, you know, each one asks for different things, but usually your financials, your 501c3 status, and who your board of directors are key elements on whether it's for a grant or a loan, not so much for service if you want them to serve on a committee, but they do wanna make sure that your organization meets the definition of community development. Be honest and open in your communications and remember you're building a relationship. Just like any friendship, a professional relationship, that's the same thing that you're doing here. Next slide. So, one of the key elements, and it's very interesting, is, um, and especially for maybe the intermediate bank, small business banks, or the large banks, but they're not the huge ones, um, you need to help them along by providing them documentation to show how the activity fits the CRA definition of community development. So, if you have a clinic and you want, you're asking for an investment into your clinic or you're asking for them to loan, a loan to expand the clinic, you need to show them that the clients that this clinic is serving is, it's not enough for it to be in an LMI area because I've seen um, a um, practice that was doing um, uh, what do you call it, uh, surgeries to beautify yourself. Um, and it just happened to be in a low mod income area. That wasn't gonna count because the clients they were serving were not low moderate income. So the number of clients that are receiving um, Medi-Cal services um, could be part of the discussion, the presentation of why they should fund it. If um, it's, a um, uh, food market in an area, you know, you can show that the demographics of the area, there's no markets in it, and you provide them the documentation. Some of those um, programs that are providing like a financial education kind of program for schools, well, what's the percentage of children that are receiving um, lunch subsidies? You know, if 51% of the children are, receive, are on lunch subsidies, then that could count. Um, but sometimes they need the documentation uh, because they're not gathering it. And then when the examination comes, well, how do you prove this? Um, they're over there trying to figure out how to get the information to document mm -hmm. the um, loan or the investment or the service. So, um, so the client served have to be low mod income. 
uh, community um, receiving the grants or loans, if, unless they're revitalizing or economic development plans, they're part of a revitalization plan, and that is specifically helping uh, create jobs for low mod income individuals or keep jobs, those would qualify and having that documentation helps. So identify and share ways to help manage risk. So for example, if it's a CDFI, Community Development Financial Institution, and it's looking for um, an investment, you know, how are they managing their risk on the loan portfolios, of the loans that they're originating, having that documentation, which most of them are pretty astute at putting all that together. And then um, if their community development assistance requires potent reporting provided timely, you, there are so many banks that will say, you know, once we give them the money and then we want quarterly reports or an annual report, we never hear from them until they want money again. And so that's not part of building your great relationship. And what we've seen during the pandemic is that some of the banks decided that they would go and fund the organizations that they had been supporting, that they would provide them additional funding. Some of them decided that those that had received funds for targeted projects, they would release that requirement and allow the money to be used for general operating. So it's important to develop these relationships with the financial institutions so they know who you are and they know how they're help you are, they are helping you help your community. And so Mary, when you say yes. that, um, developing the relationship, um, there's this, I'll just speak for myself, I have a perception that banks just know you by your account number um, and you're no longer on a first name basis like you were quote in the old days. Who do you build that relationship with? Is it the community development manager? Yes, you develop, it's with the community development or the CRA manager. Okay. Um, it, it depends. So for example, and sometimes what I've seen in rural areas is the bank will appoint a branch manager to serve in that role because, um, you know, it may not be as easy for them to, to get there. Arizona also have has banks that are headquartered uh, out of state and maybe mm -hmm. only have a couple of branches in Scottsdale. Um, but the whole Maricopa County is part of their assessment area um, or Tucson. And so um, in those cases, I've seen them tell me because as a regular, I'm working with those banks as well. They'll say, well, we've determined that Mary Smith will be our designated person in that uh, community to participate in the events that you regulators are having, as well as the touch point person for that community. Okay, very good. Um, okay, I think I covered this. Next slide. So your role in CRA compliance is um, talk to the bank regulators. We talked about this there, you know, you're the best uh, organizations to provide them with what the community needs are. And they reach out uh, for community contacts. Um, you have the right to provide comments about a bank CRA performance and to request that and be included in the CRA public file and you have a right to review a bank CRA public file. You're entitled to do that. So, and now the ways that everything is um, so computerized and online, it's easier to obtain these than it was back in the 80s where you'd have to actually go in and they'd have to print you a copy um, or you'd have to sit there reviewing it. Um, those days are kind of past, uh, fortunately. Um, so next slide. I wanted to share with you in one place some of the resources that we talked about. So to obtain information on the bank, you know, who their regulator is, what's their asset size, you would go to bank find, fdic.gov backslash bank find. To find information about uh, the schedules, the performance evaluations, the demographic data, you would go to the FFIEC website, which is listed there. 
Additionally, the FDIC does a study every two years uh, on the unbanked and underbanked households. And um, the information is available online. You can actually uh, access data and create charts from it, for example, for the state of Arizona. And it also has the information for the uh, Maricopa uh, County. Um, is the only count because they only do the top 25 metropolitan statistical areas and the Phoenix MSA is part of it. Mm -hmm. And then the FDIC has a whole uh, financial education program. It's absolutely free. It, um, we have different formats. One of them is for a um, teacher led kind of instruction, which provides uh, a leader's guide, which is a scripted format for the person to provide the training. It includes the PowerPoint presentation that goes with it and also has a participant's workbook because there's a lot of exercises to make sure the participants are engaged. We also have a computer based and next month we'll be coming out with a really retooled new version for computer based um, that can be individually driven. And as each person completes a module, they'll be able to uh, uh, have a certificate for it so that it could be utilized as part of a program to demonstrate that they had undertaken the financial education. So we have Money Smart for adults, for young adults, for older adults, and for small business. All of the programs are in English and Spanish. And the Money Smart for adults is currently being um, translated into additional languages. Okay. I think so, we've got some questions down in the chat. Okay, let me see if they show up in mine. No, they're not showing up other than Paul's. So far, nothing shows up. So tell me, what do you, what do you see? Sure. Um, John and Eloy, uh, how do the regulators grade the bank on meeting the CRA? Um, is it a percentage of depository receipts or some other measure that should be allocated by the bank to receive a satisfactory grade? So depending on whether um, it's a small a bank, a intermediate, small, large bank, there's different criteria that they are revaluated on. So a small bank doesn't really um, have much CRA that they have to do um, because you know their assets are generally I believe it's less than 326 million so they have five ratios that they have to meet um, but the intermediate small bank does get evaluated on their community development activities and for them they're all put together so service investment and lending are compiled and that is um, the rating that they're they're reviewed on large banks have independent or three tests the lending test the service test and the investment test the lending test counts for 50 percent of the grade and the other two for 25 percent there is no set criteria the the million dollar question had always been by banks and having been a former banker and cra manager i'll tell you is how much is enough so there's no answer to to that what we what the regulators do is they compare banks of similar sizes and look at how much they're doing in each of those categories and look at where you land up and that's how they evaluate it and that there's points for this and there's point for each of those categories they get added up and that results in your cra uh, rating. Usually, you know, we do a half day seminar and we go through all those. So I didn't really cover that in this one um, because it's mm -hmm. much more detailed. Um, uh, Andrew and Bisbee or Benson has a, a, a question I think resonates for a lot of Arizona. Most of the banks available in the area are branches of predominantly metropolitan banks. How do we get the attention of the local branches? Well, you can go in and visit with them and see what they tell you. And if, you know, they, they're really not responsive, then you reach out to um, the bank CRA manager and talk about what are they doing in your rural community that you're part of, you know, you want to make sure that your real community is part of their assessment area. 
mm-hmm. and, and say that there's some real needs and you want to know who you can work with and, and who the community can work with to uh, make the bank aware of them and, and to develop some relationships to further the you know, stability of the community, that it's in everybody's best interest. Um, and that makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, Fernando and Globe asks if, if a bank with a national or large regional presence has a freedom to, or to invest where they see fit, or do they have to invest in each census tract, as mentioned earlier? They don't have to invest in every, in every census tract, nor do they have to make like a loan in every census tract. We tend to look at the county uh, or the metropolitan statistical area. And we, the, the examiners do map out the loans and they want to make sure that if you were visually looking at them, that not all the loans are in the high income areas and hardly anything is in the low income communities. Um, because that would be part of the redlining concern. So they're looking to make sure that there's some coverage, you know, throughout the metropolitan statistical area, which in most cases is a, a county. Mm-hmm. Sometimes some of them are two, two counties or three counties, depending upon how big the county areas are. I see. Uh, <clears throat> Jeff and Yuma asked about opportunity zones and if, um, the CRA brings any added benefits to the bank or investors for uh, investments that they might make in an opportunity zone. So the opportunity zones are kind of interesting because what it is is a an individual, not a bank. Although I'll share, there's a couple of banks that did benefit from opportunity that that have an opportunity zone benefit. Is that this individual? makes money on an investment and instead of having to pay the taxes on it invest the money into an opportunity zone and the taxes on that gets deferred or forgiven after a certain point of time so they at the end of the day they don't lose any money if you think of it that way to taxes Mm -hmm. they have their whole capital but it's not related to to a bank to a lender to a lender so if but the opportunity zones were designated based on income. So low income census tracts are a part of the op- opportunity zones. So for example, if there is an investment that is occurring that has funding from an opportunity zone, but the bank maybe is doing part of the lending into whatever um, that structure is. So the opportunity serves as sort of the equity into the deal. And, um, you know, is it creating jobs for low income individuals or is it uh, creating affordable housing or is it funding a new clinic and a low mod income community is going to serve low mod income, the bank could get CRA credit from that. <coughs> I do know of a bank that acquired a bank and through the acquisition when they um, obtained the stock or they were able to uh, they uh, they made a profit on it and so what they decided to do is they turned that into an opportunity zone fund but they're utilizing the the criteria or the lending apparatus that they were accustomed to which is the low-income housing tax credit so they're doing all of their lending into affordable housing using a structure and format that they were very familiar with interesting uh, then uh, lastly, Brian Zimmerman asked, where can we find previously funded grants to better understand content and scope? If you look at the bank's performance evaluation, it'll have a few examples that it'll cite, but it'll tell you how, how much investments they made and you know whether any of them were like equity investments or um, and how much of it was grants. Um, so you can read that for each bank and their performance evaluation. Very good. Then I have a question. Um, I've seen uh, banks sponsor various community related um, events or functions. Do they get CRA credit for that or not? It depends. It's our favorite two words. It depends. <laughs> uh, um, so 
for for example, if it's just they're buying tickets to a dinner, then they're probably getting that money from their marketing budget or their mm. bank, um, you know, market development budget. That's not CRA money. Not right. not all giving that banks do is CRA money, um, or would qualify under the Community Reinvestment Act. But for example, if they were um, if you were utilizing the money to specifically uh, fund uh, financial education or specifically fund down payment assistance or specifically fund uh, grants for small businesses, you know, if the money was targeted for a CRA, um, uh, a community development activity, then it could receive CRA credit and that's where it would have to be documented. So for example, a small business, if you're talking about a chamber, well, how many of the businesses in the chamber are small business chambers? That means revenues of a million dollars or less. If the chamber is prim predominantly large corporations, then funding a chamber for certain activities is not gonna qualify. Mm -hmm. um, um, so it goes back to, you know, what's the purpose of the activity and is it is its primary purpose community development i see well very good mary this has been most helpful and, and most informative uh i feel uh, like i know much more about the fdic and the community reinvestment act than i started with so i guess that's uh, positive so um, thank you for your time and thank you especially for making time on, on your vacation and we hope uh, we hope to have you back and that you'll come and see us in Arizona sometime soon. I hope so too. Yes. Thank you. Okay, Mary. Goodbye, thank you. all. Have a good day. All righty.